Is my screen uh, visible? I don't think so. Yeah. Is it visible now, my screen? Yeah. We just need the uh, full screen yeah. mode. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So yeah, today we are. Good. Today we are going to talk about uh, discuss our few things about trauma in children, especially the initial management in the emergency uh, on on arrival in the emergency room. Uh, it's a huge topic, but I wanted to give you all an overview as well. At the same time, uh, discussing a couple of uh, important concepts which have been recently been uh, been adopting and it's being uh, uh, followed. Uh, at the same time, I don't I don't want you to miss the big view. So I'll be rushing at few points. Which are common, uh, you know, things which we all uh, know. Uh, I'll be rushing few things there, and uh, specifically focusing on the initial uh, management concepts. Yeah. So just to, uh, I think any topic which we start usually we we uh, we don't have our Indian specific data. So I was just searching about this trauma in children. So fortunately, there was some uh, recent uh, statistics uh, uh, published by the Nimans Institute. So 2019 says the uh, children they form around 15% of the total uh, injury deaths, you know, of the overall uh, deaths which children form 15%, and uh, around 60,000 children aged 0 to 18 years died in 2015. Around 60,000 and 45,000 deaths were unintentional. So today, what uh, mostly we'll be discussing is uh, it might be either intentional or unintentional when the child comes based on the physiological status, the management. Uh, remain same although few other components will differ later so in injury deaths mainly 15 to 18 years the adolescent boys they form 60% of all deaths and on site uh, uh, the site of injury is mainly especially the uh, deaths were more if the injury were happening in the rural areas compared to the urban areas obviously because of the lack of the initial uh, uh, access to care uh, centers and a uh, few other insights were 41% of fatal injuries occurred on roads and 31% at home we might think that at home it might not be fatal at all but yes around uh, almost 30% uh, were uh, fatal road crashes accidents were the most common cause of child injury deaths uh, in this especially the road traffic accidents uh, formed around 40% of the deaths uh, among four, 0 to 14 years and uh, even more in 14 to 18 year old following this burns drowning and uh, falls and poisoning injuries these are these were the other uh, uh, remaining minor uh, category and mainly 44% of all child injury deaths occurred at the site of injury so this is very important especially if we have to uh, you know define our pre hospital care because these 44% they never came to hospital so for us to uh, you know reduce the mortality they the children uh, should reach the hospitals alive first right so this 44% uh, on site of injury they are their kind of spot deaths what we call followed by 37% in hospital and 18% during transit so this 44 and 18 is the big chunk uh, which which uh, depends on the pre hospital care but we can focus on the 37% which happened in the hospital now when we see this overall numbers the globally the road traffic accidents or the, the trauma basically the leading cause of adolescent deaths and the deaths were mainly because of the failure to secure an you know uh, compromised airway so failure to support the breathing failure to recognize and respond to the circulation part so basically unstable a b c we could not stabilize them and that caused the uh, the, the deaths the main main reason for the deaths right now uh, we got some recent uh, numbers from march uh, 2021 there was one paper which said they they uh, analyzed their uh, mortality in pediatric trauma patients so what they found is that around 2% uh, uh, you know th uh, they had some number which the, out of which 2% were median of the age of 7 years so basically what they meant was if half of their deaths occurred within 24 hours this is the most important part and the remaining half the whatever the mortality was there it was after 24 hours and the, and that was uh, uh, mainly because uh, may, maybe because of the inefficient uh, initial resuscitation or complications which were not avoidable later now in this the traumatic brain injury was the most common cause of death around 66% followed by hypoxia and hemorrhage around 8% and they had this they saw the death from hemorrhage were most often in patients sustaining gunshot which was which is very common uncommon in our scenario anyway 
So basically half of the injury deaths can be averted with efficient trauma care systems on arrival. And this 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 excludes the uh, actually uh, I'm not talking about the pre-hospital one very specifically, but on arrival in the emergency and from there onwards, whatever the system we have, uh, efficient system we we have, uh, we can avoid around half of it. So now just to uh, brief uh, think about pediatric trauma, how it is different because children are different and their airway is different to start with. The airway is smaller. They have larger tongue. They have larger occiput. And infants are nose breathers, so any any injury which uh, blocks the uh, the upper uh, respiratory, there it, it can uh, uh, cause uh, uh, respiratory compromise. And trachea is more cartilaginous and soft, so more more possibility of dynamic compression here. So la larynx is higher and more anterior shape of the epiglottis, and the cricoid ring is the narrowest point in the airway. So uh, this uh, this poses a challenge when we have to secure the airway. Right, and the trachea is short. So these are the few of the common uh, uh, the differences which we have to keep in mind when we are resuscitating children. And also, apart from this anatomical differences, there are a few other differences where the children have a smaller body, body mass than adults. So, for example, during the uh, trauma, the, the mechanism of trauma is that the, the, same, uh, the same energy Right. Uh, for example, which imparts on an adult or and a child is it results in a greater force, you know, being applied per unit of body area so because of the small body, the body surface area, right? And this concentrated energy is transmitted to the body that has less fat, less connective tissue, and has a closer proximity of multiple organs. So all this is definitely going to have uh, um, multiple, uh, though you know, even uh, um, uh, blunt trauma. The injury might not be visible outside but definitely there might be a lot of uh, uh, a solid organ injury and traumatic brain injury as well and as i told the children's head is proportionately larger than adults which results in a higher frequency of blunt brain injuries in this age group because of the sheer uh, inertia uh, of the uh, head being larger than the body it causes uh, uh, brain injuries as well and one more important thing is uh, we all know that the ratio of child's body surface area to body mass is highest at birth and decreases as the child matures. So this cause as the child uh, younger the child the more loss of uh, uh, thermal energy. So hypothermia may develop quickly, especially in uh, trauma because there is a lot of exposure and a lot of uh, blood loss is is there as well. And along with hypotension, this is going to become lethal triad, which I'm going to. Uh, uh, explain in some time and child skeleton is incompletely calcified so in a way this is this is beneficial so that there are no uh, obvious fractures but there can be uh, what we call as a multiple green stick or it, it can withstand a fracture uh, the uh, force more and it's more pliable so fractures might be less but then the other solid organ injuries might be more and one last thing is about cervical spine so because really unstable because as I told, because of the larger head compared to the body compared to adults and along with that weak neck muscles uh, uh, make the cervical spine injuries also more common, right? And one word about different mechanisms in different age group, right? So infants and preschoolers, they have different because of their developmental nature, uh, the infants will have different kind of injury. The preschooler will have their, their own uh, uh, specific hazards based because they are more they are uh, more curious they are uh, they want to explore the uh, environment they have their own different type of injuries in the same way school age and older children older children so older children and adolescents they they engage in more risk taking behavior and they end up having more of uh, road traffic accidents or self harm intoxication kind of injuries right now uh, when when we talk about uh, trauma life so we have something called advanced trauma life support is mainly based on concept from the adult adult trauma and management and most of it is uh, extrapolated to the pediatric but nevertheless the principles remain the same uh, so I just want you to see this big 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 picture uh, which says how a trauma <coughs> patient has to uh, go through so that we don't miss out on anything and we give them appropriate care so the preparation triage preparation is basically the initial part even uh, uh, what we call uh, even before the patient arrives so preparation of our trauma unit so how do we prepare to receive a uh, you know a child who has uh, sustained trauma and right? that is our preparation part 
triage, primary survey, urgent consideration of need to patient transfer. So if your center does not is not equipped with adequate facilities and at what time you consider that transfer, secondary survey, adjunct to secondary. So these are all components of this ATLS. And once the resuscitation happens in the emergency uh, department, then the post resuscitation monitoring and re-evaluation. So basically, it can happen in the ER if there is a prolonged stay or can happen in the continued care in the uh, ICU. And definitive care is basically uh, 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 the proper treatment of fractures, the definitive surgeries, which, which will take place later. So one important uh, component is when the child arrives, it, it, may, not, it may not be uh, only trauma. So this uh, uh, Broslow tape is the one which will help us um, uh, kind of uh, accurately uh, assess the, <coughs> the, the anthropometry part. What we need is exactly the weight. In an in a emergency situation, we may not be able to weigh the child. And the uh, recent weight, the parents may not be able to tell, the parents may not be available. And our assessment <coughs> might not be accurate. <coughs> so uh, th this is one very important cognitive aid, which will help us in, instead of uh, relying on our uh, objective assessment uh, so or subjective assessment. This is a kind of uh, thing which will tell us what, uh, based on the height, uh, what is the approximate weight. And uh, based on that, we have all the equipment and medications uh, immediately available with us. And the use of cognitive aids, especially when in uh, trauma and in that situation, when we need to act quick, right? We need to have these cognitive aids. I, I don't. I'm not expecting you to read this whole thing. This is just an example uh, to have bedside uh, stuck in in your emergency room so that you can uh, uh, easily refer to it, so that it, you, there is a less cognitive burden for you to remember things, equipment, medication dosages, drug dosages, dilutions. Definitely, this will help in better management and uh, uh, uniform uh, 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 management of the situation, right? Now, coming to the primary survey. So the primary survey is basically A, B, C, D, E, management of this. Uh, the purpose of the primary survey is to rapidly identify and manage impending or actual life-threatening to the patient. So here, uh, you don't go into the, uh, uh, what we call as... Uh, uh, okay, whatever is the surgery, okay, should we take the child for surgery, what surgery, should we uh, talk to neurosurgeon, orthopedician, just first you have to assess the ABCD part where uh, the specific five components which uh, are the, if there any uh, life-threatening aspect is there, you need to address it first, even before thinking what's, uh, what injury has happened uh, and what is the definitive management of that. Uh, this is a little bit different from from a ABCD of any sick other sick child non traumatic patient. Like there are uh, two to three components are there. I'll just go through uh, the specific parts. Right. So here, uh, when we see the airway maintenance, the airway maintenance is same. But here uh, we have to assume that any trauma child he has uh, by default cervical spine protection unless uh, cervical spine injury unless otherwise uh, uh, proved. And once we imaging is done and ruled out, only then we uh, take it as okay there is no spine injury right otherwise we assume any child arrival on tra with trauma the cervical spine injury is there and we uh, take measures for uh, cervical spine stabilization breathing and ventilation so breathing and ventilation here uh, basically we, we focus on uh, the possibility of pneumothorax hemothorax and pneumothorax and we uh, we definitely rule them out in the first there should be our uh, uh, high on the list to rule them out and manage them when when the, we are managing the breathing and ventilation part. Circulation with hemorrhage control. Basically, uh, the, there can be visible hemorrhage happening, so which, which would definitely require external compression and you have to uh, expect uh, the kind of uh, hypovolemic shock, hemorrhagic uh, shock here and be prepared for fluids and blood products, right? Uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, the less fluids and more uh, blood products, which is beneficial. Then the disability part. So assessment of neurological status, because very important is the uh, associated traumatic brain injury, right? The head injury associated, uh, which we will not be able to make out initially, only by our assessment uh, and further progression. We'll be able to know whether there is, there is a traumatic brain injury or not. And exposure part, environmental control, this is basically... Uh, uh, supports the ABCD part and completes our uh, management. 
so one quick thing is in in uh, on arrival uh, 10 second assessment what we call we can quickly assess a b c d in a trauma patient just by uh, asking themselves if we ask them to identify and asking the patient how they are feeling if they are able to identify themselves and they are quite oriented to the place and telling what's happening it means uh, largely that uh, airway breathing circulation disability is at that moment is kind is kind of stable right? there might be ongoing uh, trauma ongoing damage happening but at that time this will tell us to what extent abcd is involved right so here i was telling the in the, uh, the airway part so when we uh, talk about the cervical spine protection the main thing is here we should uh, uh, not perform the head till chin lift maneuver because that is a common when we say okay uh, the child is not, not responsive head till chin lift and then we go ahead with the uh, uh, other uh, uh, resuscitation but here we should not perform head till chin lift we have to perform jaw thrust maneuver right and at the same time you uh, uh, look for any uh, the foreign bodies in the airway it might be the, the secretion the blood any contaminant any material which was there during the injury and insert an oropharyngeal airway if you feel it is not patent and uh, plan for an establishment of a definitive airway. Then cervical spine immobilization till airway is secured, right? So here, uh, it's again a, a kind of a chicken and egg story because, for example, if you're not doing head till chin lift, right? And you have, if you have to kind of secure the airway, which is like, which is uh, compromised definitely and without securing airway, you might be kind of threatening the life of the child. So I think you have to give priority to the airway at the same time as much as possible to immobilization uh, because uh, the cervical spine injury is not very common. It, it is uh, uh, there but rare, but priority is to airway. So if you are finding it difficult to um, secure the airway at the same time of doing uh, immobilization, I think priority is for airway. If possible, you can uh, go for uh, cricotherotomy when there is a definite sign of cervical spine injury, right? And uh, once you have the manual immobilization, you definitely go with cervical collar. And if you don't have cervical collar, the simple uh, bed sheet roll can be uh, put around the neck, which will help in uh, cervical spine stabilization. So I was telling, so what's different? One, one another different part is, uh, apart from this uh, no head tail chain lift and jaw thrust, is no nasogastric tube. Uh, and orogastric tubes are recommended. This mainly if you're planning for uh, uh, no, doing uh, positive pressure ventilation uh, that can cause uh, the st stomach distension and vomiting, right? So, uh, nasogastric decompression. So, instead of uh, putting nasogastric tube, uh, better is to uh, use orogastric because assuming that there is a injury to the base of the skull, the, the nasogastric tube might uh, in, uh, co cause more compromise. So, orogastric tube is recommended and you can go ahead with the breathing part, right? Now, uh, breathing and ventilation part here main thing is once you have secured the airway and for example you are providing breathing support by positive pressure ventilation and there is a sudden deter deterioration after doing this right it's possible there might be uh, tension hemothorax mass hemothorax all this you have to uh, kind of consider immediately and you may even need not wait for them to be confirmed by x-ray you can just uh, uh, based on clinical assessment you can uh, do thoracostomy in the second intercostal space, whichever side, midclavicular line, the scalp pin set, and this will give you an idea whether there was a tension in motorex or not. If not, it's not going to harm, but if it is there, definitely it's going to uh, save the child, right? So this is the, about the breathing and ventilation part, and definitely use of ETCO2 monitoring definitely helps to make sure uh, uh, the tube is in the right place, and we also know about the uh, resuscitation part. Now, uh, coming to the circulation and hemorrhage control. So here, the, ma the major threat is to uh, manage uh, the circulation part is hemorrhagic shock. So blood loss, if it is obvious, external hemorrhage, if it is visible, you always try to control that by uh, pressure. And you, uh, based on the mechanism of injury, right? during the whole process, you will be obviously getting the history from the uh, parents or uh, attenders. And uh, understanding the history, understanding the mechanism of injury, if it is high impact, low impact, any external injuries are there or, is, or any occult bleed is possible, intra-abdominal bleed is possible, which, which might be the reason for hemorrhagic shock, right? So you have to um, anticipate and prepare for that. 
and definitely as soon as the child arrives two large iv catheters so definitely uh, as much as possible two based on the uh, gravity of the situation if not if uh, iv is not possible intraoperative uh, for initial fluid therapy is the best now circulation and hemorrhage control uh, e even if the external injuries are not you know visible but the level of consciousness tells us if it is you know altered or if it is drastically change or dropping mental status it you can assume there is a, there might be a massive blood loss if there is a, uh, the skin perfusion is cool clammy and gray dusky skin you can assume there is a definite uh, hemorrhage was there if external is not visible you can assume there is internal uh, bleed happening bounding pulse might might be early sign of blood loss but thready pulse is definitely a late sign external bleeding to be stopped immediately by compression and tourniquet possible right then coming to the disability part that the life threat to and the life threatening part to identify here is a traumatic brain injury right so de de determine the loss of con the level of consciousness using uh, gcs so here our regular avpu might not help so the gcs is specifically for the um, uh, trauma uh, neuro evaluation in uh, trauma and here neuro neurological evaluation uh, being normal does not rule out cervical spine injury now if you say that in a child okay the child is able to move the neck able to move all the limbs it might not definitely rule out cervical spine injury it might tell us that yeah definitely there might not be any major uh, uh, cervical spine injury or major uh, uh, injuries in, in the brain but that is at that moment but if the ongoing damage is there ongoing injury is happening it can change with time and uh, one important thing is when you are checking the pupils and when you are checking the eye exam especially during disability the, our our usual thing is to you know move the head and check the eye movements and pupils so definitely you have to avoid that uh, do not move the spine while examining eye movements and pupils you have to be careful and assess the and uh, size of the pupils especially if you are suspecting any traumatic brain injury the size of the pupils equality and the reaction all these three things uh, we have to very specifically focus on it and keep re evaluation with every intervention right so this is our, as we know the the pediatric glasgow coma scale which will help us uh, in assessing the um, current condition and the exposure part so this is basically to avoid uh, any, any hypothermia and uh, make sure you have a regular hygiene the glucose part and uh, and if possible in when we are anticipating more fluids to be given iv fluids especially if we have pre warmed fluids it will help in preventing the hypothermia part and these are all the things which we use especially for monitoring cardiac mortality so i think this is something very basic and one specific thing is e fast the uh, in the using usage of uh, ultrasound in trauma management especially to figure out any intra abdominal bleed this will help us to Uh, plan for at least to know what is the extent of uh, loss if it is there or not extent of injury uh, it will not tell us definitely to what extent the injury is the injury is there or not and based on this we can take the take the child for uh, definitive um, uh, imaging later so there is one uh, simple trauma score uh, which will measure, which will uh, which uh, uh, grossly tells about the uh, prognosis based on the weight airway blood pressure cns and any skeletal injuries right based on this if the score is more than 8 uh, the mortality should be less than one um, uh, around was one per less than that because this good prognosis so it all depends on how well we manage if less than 8 trauma center and uh, four predicts around 50% mortality and less than one predicts 98% mortality so we have to focus more on this uh, 1% and uh, 50% part so the less than one score definitely Might be very difficult. Now, coming to, once we know that the primary survey is done, ABCD is taken care. Once we have identified all the life-threatening aspects of the uh, whatever the injury has happened, trauma. Now, coming to the secondary survey, where uh, there can there can be other injuries which might not be life-threatening or life-threatening, but may not be in the uh, affecting ABC at that point of time. so this is basically to be done only after primary survey is done and resuscitation is underway and parallelly there can be a, a, because it's a, always a team work so uh, abc is happening concurrently there is a person taking a history from the um, uh, the parents or uh, bystanders and getting to know about the uh, what we call as the, the child's past history and what is the mechanism of injury and and also assessing the other part so 
these are all the other things the head to toe exam head to toe part specifically focusing on the detection of any other injuries is very important right now when we come to this head and head and maxillofacial cervical spine and neck chest abdomen all these can have other life threatening injuries as well but they may not be compromising abc at that moment of time right especially the abdomen so there might be for example uh, there might be some solid organ injury you can figure out the uh, guarding rigidity tenderness or gross uh, distension of the abdomen there can be a bleed and there or there can be uh, uh, urethral injuries where you can find out any hematuria is there so all that needs to be handled and spe uh, specifically the musculoskeletal part if there are limb injuries uh, it can the obvious uh, fractures and open wounds are easily visible but if we uh, are not able to see them the more important part is the compartment syndrome right you have to anticipate that and make sure you relieve the pressure coming to the venous access part uh, peripheral venous access if it is there great but if it's not there interosseous access and if you are not able to as that as well venous cut down uh, is definitely the need uh, to make sure we resuscitate them right okay i'll go to the fluid flood fluid and blood replacement in a while so overall the therapeutic goals are slowing of the heart rate clearing of the sensorium return of peripheral pulses return of normal skin warmth uh, you know the systolic blood pressure coming to the our therapeutic goal and urinary output everything we may not be able to achieve immediately especially the sensorium part definitely circulation should uh, normalize but if there is ongoing loss it may not normalize immediately so uh, just to keep in mind uh, uh, what are our goals now coming to the most important part is this uh, the recent concept of damage control resuscitation uh, so here this concept came from the world war 1 from us navy where Uh, there was uh, their uh, ship was under attack and what they thought was okay now uh, when they are on a mission the whole thing they can do is reduce the damage that happened from uh, from the threat and complete the mission right they may not be able to address the uh, the definitive uh, cause of the damage which they were undergone but the reduce the damage whatever has happened and complete the mission so this is uh, applying in trauma resuscitation in emergency uh, what we can do is Uh, we may not be able to immediately address the, for example, fractures or hemorrhage that is ongoing immediately, right? Which might require surgical intervention. But the 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 hypotension, the bleeding which it is causing, definitely that can be addressed as soon as possible, right? So basically, we call it as lethal triad in trauma: the the hypothermia, metabolic acidosis, and coagulopathy, right? The coagulopathy is basically because of the uh, um, um, Uh, what we call as the hemorrhage happening and the uh, the um, uh, consequences of that hypothermia and metabolic all these act together and they cause decreased myocardial performance and, th and this is the triad which we which we need to address in the damage control resuscitation part so what exactly is a traumatic coagulopathy right so there is a tissue injury there is a shock and the that triad which we discussed all this causes endogenous response and is supposed to increase the activated protein c the the endothelial layer the platelet dysfunction fibrinogen depletion and this is going to cause what we call as traumatic coagulopathy this is basically any major uh, uh, hemorrhage is there on top of it the tissue injury and right? the, sh the the shock part and the tissue injury along with uh, hypothermia this is going to uh, cause the traumatic coagulopathy this is what we need to uh, the damage control resuscitation is going to address so what are the components the damage control resuscitation here uh, there are there are actually five to six components where uh, we will uh, i'll just go through one by one right so the anti fibrinolytics rapid diagnosis so rapid diagnosis happens concurrently where we need to figure out uh, if there is no external bleed uh, from where is that a massive hemorrhage happening and internal bleed is happening and how to address that crystalloids and early transfusion strategy permissive hypotension and rapid anatomic control right so going to this hypotensive resuscitation this is something uh, which was uh, uh, you know seen in uh, again all this uh, most of trauma concepts coming from uh, um, uh, from the war and the so soldiers who had injuries and the management so blood that is sorely needed may be lost right if normotensive state is targeted so uh, as we all know 
we have our uh, um, target blood pressure to reach, especially when a sick child arrives. So we always um, uh, target for that, uh, provide uh, normal cell, the boluses, right? The fluid resuscitation happens and we always, okay, the, the blood pressure is on, on the normal range. But in that normal range, uh, if you are having especially any uh, hemorrhages happening, right? If there are any injuries are there, external injuries are there, they, the blood, you might lose the blood, which is uh, very much important, right? So, normotensive uh, targeting is not going to be beneficial. At, it might be beneficial at that time, but ultimately, you might lose the child. So, hypotensive resuscitation is basically restricts the use of colloid, uh, crystalloid fluids, allowing blood pressure to be remain lower than normal, right? Just, uh, just around the lower, uh, lower range of the normal, uh, limiting secondary blood loss until initial hemostasis can be accomplished, right? And uh, what they have seen is in animal models, the map of around 45 to 50 was sufficient to maintain brain and heart perfusion. And especially around 50, if you maintain in a, in a child with trauma and we keep monitoring the uh, urine output, we should be able to um, achieve this hypotensive resuscitation. Airway management, uh, as we told, assuming cervical spine injury, take precautions, low threshold for surgical uh, cricotomy. In a hypotensive patient, lower doses of sedation are usually given. While higher than normal doses of paralytics can be used to decrease the time of onset. We also need to make sure that whatever medications we are using, uh, it's not going to cause hemodynamic instability. That's very important. And it's important when uh, on arrival, uh, when possible, to briefly resuscitate the patient before administrating any uh, agents and start inotropes early. Right, Fluid and inotropes uh, start early. Uh, before you are uh, paralyzing the child and uh, um, uh, having definitive airway management. Coming to fluid resuscitation, yes, normal saline can be the first bolus to start with, but you have to keep in mind that if you're anticipating uh, large volumes of uh, fluid requirement, so crystalloid fluid promotes acidosis, dilutes coagulation factors and disturbs inflammatory mediators, especially in large quantities. That, and there was some study which showed that if the ratio of uh, crystalloid and uh, PRBC, right, it's the 1.5 to 1, there was 70% higher risk of multiple organ failure, ARDS and uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, it makes sense because uh, we are in the fluid is only going to address the uh, blood pressure part, but the quality of the, uh, the circular, what's uh, circulating in the, uh, in the circulatory system, especially the uh, there is no correlation factors, the hemoglobin might not increase, right? Uh, this might be causing the, as I told, the traumatic coagulopathy as well. Coming to the important aspect of using fresh whole blood or PRBC or plasma and platelets, right? While the use of uh, fresh whole blood in trauma is, is promising, uh, uh, primarily as a transfusion, but only when component therapy is not available, this might help. But when you have a component, like for example, PRBC, plasma and plates available, the ratio 1 is to 1 is to 1 was found to be most beneficial. Right, And there is one more uh, thing which was uh, recently uh, studied that pre-hospital PRBC and plasma had greatest mortality benefit uh, and giving only fluids uh, before reaching the hospital might even have a worse survival. So pre-hospital PRBC and plasma may be uh, ideal if you have the trauma systems which handle the you know, child who even before they come to the hospital. So that comes to the overall uh, part of the massive transfusion protocol. So these are the signs. If your blood loss is expected to be more than 10, 20 beyond that ml per kg, then definitely not more than 10 ml per kg of crystalloid and following followed by RBC, FFP and platelet in the ratio 1 is to 1 is uh, beneficial. One uh, point about the resuscitation associated coagulopathy, right? Uh, so the, the concept here is the large volumes of coagulation factor deficient fluids such as crystalloid, albumin or packed red blood cells are administered during a resuscitation. So when we are uh, resuscitating the sick child, the, uh, the fluid boluses and sometimes albumin also can be given hemacyl, PRBC, but all these will not have the coagulation factors. They you just provide PRBC fluids, right? So this causes the resuscitation associated coagulopathy, right? So this is, we are resuscitating and that is causing coagulopathy. And as I told in the, in the triad, there is another intrinsic resuscitation independent coagulopathy. This is basically from the injury itself. So injury itself is causing one part by activating the protein C. Our resuscitation with fluids and uh, coagulation deficient products cause another uh, uh, damage. So uh, the, the thing is here, 
the, the point I want to come to is the, the standard um, coagulation test, which you do PT, APTT, uh, they, they measure uh, uh, only few parameters, right? The, ignoring other components of coagulants such as uh, platelets and fi uh, the fibrin, right? Fibrin, fibrinogen products. They are not measured by this PT, APTT. So the concept, the, the recent one is to do whole blood viscoelastic analysis, what is called as. So here, what, what, what the, the two important thing is TEG, thromboelastography and rotational thromboelastometry. These are the two things which are used in especially anesthesia and surgery to guide us on the what components to be given. So here it is a test which does and ultimately you get a report, right? So th these are the two things, the TEG and ROTEM. Uh, the, here what happens is uh, the whole blood viscoelastic testing can identify deficits in clotting factors, the clot strength, excessive clot breakdown and thereby allowing a goal directed transfusion strategy that can replenish deficient factors and targeted minimized transfusion. So here uh, we can uh, specifically based on the outcome of the test, we can specifically give either uh, platelets or uh, plasma or cryoprecipitate. Right? So I will just show briefly show how uh, this test report uh, happens. So I'm not going to de into details of how the test is done. Ultimately, when the test is done, you will get to know these parameters. This will tell, for example, this is like this is TEG guided resuscitation protocol where you will know based on the values to give whether FFP, cryoprecipitate, platelets, or and uh, uh, tranexamic acid. Right? The, if we know what to give at what time, definitely I think it's going to be a huge uh, 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 benefit. Right? Now coming to this la last part, coming the, the hemorrhage control part, the tranexamic acid uh, is definitely going to help, especially if there, there is external bleed or occult bleed. There was some study, CRASH-2 trial, which uh, found a very significant reduction in uh, um, uh, mortality. So definitely uh, uh, IV tranexamic acid, uh, especially in a, in a child when you are anticipating some uh, hemorrhage, it can always help. And neuroprotective measures, head end elevation, 3% saline infusion, and maintaining cerebral perfusion pressure, along with uh, identifying the extent of injury, right? If it is, for example, uh, a major bleed is there, the, the, the craniotomy done as soon as possible can definitely help, right? Now, there is one more component uh, part called as damage control surgery, right? So here it, it happens concurrently with damage control resuscitation. This is mainly uh, uh, the surgical part where if you're not, if there is a, a injury happened and the ongoing losses are there, which are not able to uh, stop it immediately. So they have to be taken up for surgery, but the goal of this surgery is not to you know, fix the fractures or do any major uh, correction. Mainly they, uh, they, they, they take, they're taken up for surgery to uh, stop the bleeding immediately. Right. So, and may, and containing any contamination, any cont obvious contamination is removing it, applying temporary closure devices uh, such as abdominal packing, hemostatic agents, vascular shunting, endovascular stenting. The goal is to minimize time in the operating room, limiting further bleeding and heat loss and uh, uh, take the child to ICU to continue uh, resuscitation and metabolic derangement before a planned return to the operating room. So, you're not fixing any fractures here or any uh, other uh, injuries which are uh, uh, not contributing to the hemorrhage. And so th this was about the damage control resuscitation, damage control surgery, and coming to the anxiety and pain relief, right? So with, this is usually uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, ignored part or from the from a child's perspective, the, the anxiety and pain itself can alter the parameters which we are uh, monitoring. So here, simple IV paracetamol is as effective as the morphine. And here we have to make sure that you have to select the medication which has least negative effects on hemodynamic status, right? The analgesic dose of uh, ketamine and uh, fentanyl uh, can help if you feel the paracetamol is not helping. In fact, uh, ketorolac, ketorolac and uh, tramadol, they have done some study, but uh, they are also quite effective. Uh, one specific caution is tramadol, especially in uh, traumatic brain injury patients, might cause uh, increased agitation. So you can avoid that. But other than that, you have to make sure that you address this pain relief. Otherwise, the child is uh, agitated. Parents are also uh, frustrated. Uh, so that was uh, the important concept which I want to discuss. I'm not going to deep into this uh, traumatic brain injury. This is mainly early intubation for controlled ventilation, head and elevation, ICP monitoring, 
anti edema measures neurosurgical intervention if massive bleed is there and early imaging and follow up imaging to make sure uh, uh, the uh, brain is uh, protected abdominal trauma we have to uh, this uh, the e fast definitely helps here the blunt injury is more common vital organs can get injured so liver lacerations spleen splenic rupture hemoperitoneum bowel injury all these have to be identified and they have to be addressed and uh, application of pelvic binder especially we are suspecting any vessel injuries in the pelvis musculoskeletal as i told uh, injury the fractures and uh, have, you have to figure out the fractures and uh, and, uh, and identify any compartment syndrome and if any amputated parts are there it can be preserved in ice pack and uh, immediate surgical intervention can uh, help them and ultimately the, the physician nursing coordination is very important so every day hurdle to start with for designation of task for the day in the emergency department if at all any sick child arrives who is going to take care of the airway breathing circulation and all our medication parts stocks and have to be kind of uh, checked to have a clear and loud communication and uh, doing drills simulation always helps in uh, managing any uh, unanticipated situation right at the end documentation consent and uh, mlc documentation of all this trauma is very important counseling appropriate counseling at frequent multiple appropriate counseling always uh, help the situation record maintenance and early identification of red flags in family dynamics right this is very important to prevent any mob uh, uh, you know, dynamics and uh, violence i think that, that was i wanted to share about trauma thank you wonderful thanks shrinivas Thank uh, to give like a it's it's very difficult to give a overview or an extensive talk on a very uh, important topic like this um any questions from anybody then i'm going to fire away quite a few thing regarding hypotensive resuscitation especially when yeah. you have a severe traumatic uh, head injury Uh, whether we should really follow that i agree we should not give too much of fluids causing uh, dam more damage but maybe early uh, inotrope uh, to raise the map uh, that is more uh, beneficial rather than sticking to lower map uh, that's what i felt uh, i think that's correct so here again we have to balance the uh, uh, neuro part and if there mm. if there are no external hemorrhages right if uh, targeting a higher map is not going to increase the hemorrhage not going to increase the blood loss yeah definitely we can uh, target it but i think we can have just adequate to make sure the cerebral perfusion is uh, maintained i'm going to so just easy. say one thing so actually the context of uh, hypotensive resuscitation is more in terms of the penetrating injuries when we talk about penetrating injuries it is more like the gunshot wound uh, injuries or uh, you know vascular injuries that are going to cause you immense blood loss okay that is the context where we talk more about hypotensive resuscitation so uh, in terms of sangeeta for our civilian trauma so as what uh, shrinivas told initially you know it is more to do with uh, you know the from where do we get all these guidelines from so most of them are military uh, settings okay these are the settings not we have tried to apply it to civilian trauma okay so penetrating injuries where there is an obvious risk of excessive bleed you increase the pressure it is just going to bleed out more okay Correct. and you have not fixed it okay so mm -hmm. this is where the context of hypotensive resuscitation comes when you have an injury where there is no obvious penetrating injury mm -hmm. okay when there is no obvious penetrating injury but potential um, you know um, vascular bleed for example you have a grade 4 or grade 5 liver laceration where one of your mm -hmm. vessels has actually ruptured as part of your laceration and you all like bleeding immensely okay mm -hmm. still you are like contained within the abdomen you are bleeding if you raise your blood pressure you will bleed more and you are not going to like fix it you have to fix the source okay so penetrating trauma injury where immediately you cannot stop the bleed you cannot use anything to stop it 
there you would consider hypotensive resuscitation. So this is not like a generic term that you should use that, okay, I'm going to do hypotensive resuscitation for everybody. Okay. So when it comes to polytrauma, where yes, you, should, you were shot in the brain also and you were shot in the abdomen or in your legs and you're bleeding, there it is a very difficult situation. But such, such persons, you don't have a choice. You'll have to just prioritize which you're going to work better. Okay. And that's a very rare situation for us in civilian trauma. Okay. So just um, bear that in mind. I know, God forbid, like for places like in London where you have a lot of stab injuries, we routinely do hypotensive resuscitation. Okay. It's just something to bear in mind. Okay. And so one hypotensive more resuscitation is not a generic term to be used for every person. Correct. Okay. Ma'am, one more thing. Uh, this uh, one is to one is to one protocol in a massive transfusion protocol. I feel it is not a fixed thing. So many books, different things are given in different uh, articles. Two is to one is to one. Whether we have to really stick to one is to one or how it is? How are you going to okay. decide about it? Good question. So when uh, the massive transfusion protocols were put in, okay, people did not know what is the right ratio. Okay, So if you have, say, in the early world wars, you know, people used to give whole blood transfusion. The whole blood transfusion uh, concept was removed because of all these various CJDs, this, that, and the other that was coming in. So they, we went to all split products, okay? So you have PRBC, fresh frozen plasma, platelets, everything, cryo, everything separated, okay? Now, if you do want whole blood, okay, you are not able to get it, okay? Or maybe you can get it, but with a lot of restrictions. Okay. In a trauma setting, the most important thing is you have to replace the whole blood component. Now you are in such a situation where you don't have the whole blood available to be transfused immediately to the patient. You have only split components. It makes sense to give it in the right ratio as what the whole blood is. That is where the concept of one is to one and all that comes from. Okay. So the real sense of really achieving without reaching the point of uh, trauma coagulopathy uh, or resuscitation-induced coagulopathy, ideal is to replace the whole blood. That's what you should be doing. Okay. So it is logical to use one is to one is to one. Okay. That's where the concept comes from. Now. What to do if you don't have that one is to one is to one? Okay, that's when you just try to like do it. Can you imagine, you know, a concept where people instead of replacing the whole blood, were using crystalloids? Okay, can you see where the difference is? So did they kill anybody? No, they didn't. That was the best available. Yes, they caused multi-organ failure. You know, 70% went into multi-organ failure but they maintained their uh, immediate stability of their hemodynamics with the crystalloids alone, okay? So if you are looking at the bigger picture of providing perfect outcomes, you need to aim towards that perfection. So you lose whole blood, you replace whole blood. You don't have whole blood, you replace the equivalent components that are split components with the same ratio as what the whole blood is. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And how early trauma-induced coagulopathy can develop? Okay. So there are uh, adult studies which have shown that as early as four hours. Okay. So if you look at uh, children, uh, patients um, who have been transferred by helicopter emergency medical services, so you have like on the site of trauma, to actually you enter the trauma center and you take the blood test immediately on arrival, okay? 25% of them at admission have trauma-induced coagulopathy, okay? That's how people started. They were thinking, you know, we're doing why at admission people are having this. So Srinivas mentioned about the uh, tech viscoelastic studies. So basically, 
the early studies which identified trauma induced coagulopathy looked at inr inr of 1.3 and above was definitive of you having poor outcomes okay so 1.3 is the magic number there there are like quite a few studies that have looked at it so uh, trauma physicians look at inr of 1.3 but that is not the definitive test okay so people did something called thromboelastometry uh, or uh, uh, te test at the site at the site okay so when iran iraq uh, not iran the afghanistan and iraq war happened about a decade ago at that time the military uh, surgeons did tech tests on spot to find out what was happening and they found on spot also they found quite a few variations of uh, the coagulopathy so uh, you know not all so they would give all these components some would improve and some would deteriorate and they didn't know why if they stuck to only inr so that's how they came to the conclusion that inr is not a good test it doesn't look at the whole spectrum it just looks at a small component and it's in fact it is quite late in the scenario to resuscitate so then they went to teg and tem where they started doing these tests to identify where the issues were and they found that for some there is hyperfibrinolysis for some there is excessive thrombosis so these were the specific components that they had to address so you know tem based resuscitation is supposed to be ideal but difficult to follow in civilian trauma i think uh, there is one study from royal london which i think uh, dr karim brohi has done so you can just uh, pick up some uh, you know insight into that about how tem helps in like predicting uh, coagulopathy in trauma he is like one of the biggest authorities of uh, coagulopathy in trauma okay so we wanted to look at uh, in pediatric trauma so if i was in uk maybe by now i would have answered all those questions <laughs> all right any other questions so a few things that i want to just uh, you know uh, provide as a recap okay so uh, one thing is always 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 try to find out what is the mechanism of injury okay as much as you assess the patient history is important so mechanism of injury how many people were injured on site were there any deaths during that road traffic accident all and what is the type of damage that the vehicle sustained these are important histories that you have to take okay mechanism of injury in trauma defines what injuries the patient may have and guides you with your primary and secondary and potentially tertiary survey okay so it's very important to know the mechanism of injury if it is a serious injury like for example um, you know a fall fall when is it significant two and a half times the patient's height okay that they have studied they have studied which are the life sustainable and which are the life threatening injuries and for uh, fall the height of from where they fell is important and rough estimate is two and a half times the patient height so always take the history properly for falls for um, you know road traffic accidents for the type of penetrating injuries if there is any okay so mechanism of injury is very important okay the second thing is uh, about uh, you know the airway management about uh, this one okay uh, when you are doing your primary assessment okay gcs on scene is very important because we don't know what the transit time is so timing mechanism of injury was it a witnessed injury if so what was the you know immediate gcs on scene okay and in gcs particularly we want to know what the motor component is so if your motor component of gcs is more than 
likely that that patient is going to sustain well in spite of his uh, traumatic brain injury, okay? What it is when he comes to you, okay? So think about all of those when you are writing down your history, okay? Uh, primary assessment about C-spine, okay? So although we say that, so Srinivas, you put the thing to say that neurological assessment uh, for C-spine injury is uh, not very reliable, and C-spine is the, I mean, CT is the more definitive. This is more valid for adult trauma, okay? For pediatrics, 30% are skivora, okay? That is spinal cord injury without radiological abnormality. Okay. So in pediatrics, for us, still neurological assessment is important, but they should not have any distracting injuries. For example, their GCS is poor or they have a left hand fracture or uh, something like that that is restricting to demonstrate their uh, movements, okay? So in pediatrics, we still stick to thorough, complete neurological assessment without distracting injury. Then only you can clear the C-spine. So just because you see a normal CT, you cannot clear the C-spine in children. Okay, that holds true for adults. Adults, 98% correlation that there is no significant cervical spine injury if your CT is normal. So uh, adults don't routinely wait for it. Whereas in pediatrics, about 30% have ligamentous injuries and other injuries. So skivora is very common. So we uh, still stick to uh, neuro assessment plus neuroimaging. Okay, and then in terms of airway management, you highlighted that, you know, in, in order to protect the C-spine, it is important to, to have a fine balance between like, uh, you know, how to get the definitive airway. So in trauma, that's why trauma centers actually have like the video laryngoscopes. They have the, this one, what is it, uh, bronchoscopies, so that they can do under vision without moving the head, uh, you know, safe intubation, okay? And surgical airway as necessary. Majority of the time, they use video laryngoscope and they just tube them safely. In terms of fixing the, doing the midline, inline stabilization, stabilization for C-spine during a definitive airway placement, Always make sure there is one team member that is delegated only for midline inline stabilization. So that person stands opposite to the intubator on the, you know, towards the chest of the patient and then holds the patient in midline. Okay. So they are not standing at the head end to hold the midline in line. Okay. They stand at the opposite side and then hold the, uh, they stand towards the right side of the patient near the chest and then they lean forward and they uh, hold both their hands from this side of the uh, bed to actually hold the patient's head in midline. The person who is intubating is then free to have a look. So these are like a couple of things that I would just want us to like keep ourselves reminded of. If you think you are stuck, you know, there is nothing like a trade-off between C-spine because C-spine injury, even after you have survived the patient by tubing the patient, actually, if you give them a quadriplegia, you know, nobody is going to thank you for saving their life. So let us just think of safe ways of intubation and uh, doing it safely rather than trading it off. Okay. Then uh, there was some discussion about crystalloids. Okay. So definitely that you know earlier i think uh, even a decade ago people in most of the books in india used to have like 20 ml per kg three boluses of crystalloids definitely you are like it's a recipe for you know a death certificate okay so 5 ml per kg okay in the worst case or best case scenario but during that 5 ml per kg crystalloids, you should be getting your own negative blood to the patient, PRBC by the bedside, okay? If you are needing to give nearly 40 ml per kg of uh, PRBC for any reason, then 
you don't have a choice but to do one is to one is to one and you don't have a choice and that is a massive transfusion okay if you didn't look for a co cause to fix that uh, trauma you know whatever is the source of bleeding then it is unlikely that that patient is going to survive so actually this is a patient where you don't waste your time in taking them to ct and checking where the injuries are you just rush them to theaters and do a, you know and fix wherever those injuries are okay admission blood gas is quite a useful one because it helps you to determine you know if there is any lactic acidosis if got your base deficit is and also looking at your inr okay it just goes to show and also pulse pressure matters in uh, trauma okay so these are like a few things that we have to like try to remember okay and as what shrinivas told pre hospital care i mean what we have to understand is only 30 to 40% of cases enter the hospital okay where you can like definitely do something to save their lives the remaining 40 to 50% just don't make it to our hospital okay they die on the streets commonest or rather uh, 40% of them are due to hemorrhagic shock so that is why you know when we were in the uk we initiated uh, prbc transfusion o negative blood to be given on site of trauma by the time they reach it and then they are like brought through helicopter medical emergency services to uh, the, to the er er is only a pit stop to say this is the patient and they just get wheeled into the ot the trauma ot is just next to the er where they open up there's like you know the preparation so there's a vascular surgeon including everybody who is like ready to stop it okay then when there is bleeding okay when there is active bleeding okay when we talk about direct pressure then we talk about tourniquet so when you are applying the tourniquet tourniquet is enough tight so that you obliterate the pulse okay so it should be that tight and then that is only a temporary thing till your definitive care is happening immediately okay so just to think about those ways and while we are in this hospital one of the other ways of stopping the bleed especially vascular is taking the help of our interventional radiologists which we have the luck here to use their help okay so you can like just stop the bleed with the interventional radiology to just block it okay so just think about these strategies if you are like in that situation okay and try to involve as many specialists as possible once you stabilize your primary uh, once you do your primary survey top to toe front to back you know everything uh, you know uh, uh, should be systematically documented and log roll should be done making sure that the spine is intact and checking over everything okay so make sure that the secondary survey happens uh, on time and it is documented i think there is a trauma resuscitation record that we have kept for our er and also for our picu please make sure that that is filled in it is fairly uh, comprehensive and it has almost all the information that you need so utilize the trauma resuscitation record for all uh, polytrauma cases that come to our hospital okay any questions from nurses so the incident tape is available no ha uh, roslo tape is available in our uh, crash pad all the crash pads all floors Hmm. okay and all the equipments are packed in those colored uh, packets only okay so you don't need to search everything as per the broslo tape per uh, you know category so there is pink orange blue or whatever we have categorized those equipment as per broslo tape and packed it in the thing so if you do have a crash all you have to do is know in which color the patient's height is 
and then that particular packet you just have to pick it up from your crash card okay so please do familiarize with the crash card contents uh, apart from picu and er okay in all other areas everywhere even in our adult er for all emergencies it is broslo tape uh, specified okay so it's as safe as it can be just make sure that everybody is familiar with it okay so we can do some sim drills to like make sure that everybody is familiar with it i'm still not happy with our uh, like emergency response okay how we can kind of our team dynamics and everything we'll do we'll have to do lot more uh, drills to get there okay any other questions from anybody else wonderful uh, talk shrinivas thank you so much thank you thank you thank you everyone thanks